wait until they are seated. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome the chair of the Churchill Club Board of Directors, Dan O'Lewin. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. As mentioned, I'm Dan O'Lewin. I'm the chair of the Churchill Club this year, and I'm also a corporate vice president at Microsoft, where I have responsibility for things here in Silicon Valley and in general working with uh, emerging businesses, startups, venture capitalists. Welcome to tonight's event. This is uh, sort of a really exciting event from my standpoint for various reasons because like most of you in the room uh, I grew up on Disney uh, and like most of you in the room um, you've been in Silicon Valley for a long time so you know a little bit about Reed. So welcome to the event. We're thrilled to have Reed Hastings here, CEO and Chairman of Netflix and Michael Eisner who's right now the founder of the Tornante Group uh, and as we all know had an illustrious history um, at the Walt Disney Company for a long time. Before I begin the brief introduction, let me first make a couple of announcements about the club. There was reference to, for those of you who are tweeting, uh, sort of using the, uh, the Pound Churchill Club uh, tweet uh, reference. But uh, also, uh, I want to make some reference um, to a couple of upcoming events. Next week on the 25th, uh, the club will be hosting Ariana Huffington, uh, editor-in-chief of the Huffington Post, in a conversation with Rich Carlgaard, who's the editor, as you know, of Forbes magazine. On the 1st of March, um, there's going to be a program associated with corporate reputation management. Maybe some interesting questions for the likes of these two tonight as well. Um, but as always, the club brings forward, we think, good and interesting topics for those of you in the community who want to want to dive in on those things. If you're not a member of the Churchill Club, I'd encourage you to consider it. It's events like this that are reserved for the member community, and so we want to thank those of you uh, who are members and those who'd like to join can go to the website and find the necessary information. And then finally, uh, again, before the introductions, I'd like to thank Fenwick and West, who's been a sponsor for this evening. So let's give them a nice round of applause. Uh, let me first introduce Michael Eisner. I think it's a real privilege um, that we have him here tonight. He has been, uh, and it's appropriately phrased in the remarks that I was, reference material that I was given, a force of nature in the entertainment industry. He, over four decades, did amazing things for the industry. And as the chairman and CEO of the Walt Disney Company, he transformed the company from really a film and theme park company with $1.8 billion in enterprise value into a global media company with $80 billion in value. So that is quite a run. Um, so we want to thank him for that. Prior to that, involved in the movie industry with Paramount Pictures as president and executive at ABC, and so I won't dwell on it. He's a well-known figure, uh, but again, I want to thank Michael for being here tonight. It's a real honor. Reed Hastings, co-founder and chairman and CEO of Netflix. Also, I'm going to point out a board member at Microsoft, and I'll also reference a friend of mine. I've known him a long time, and I'm really happy that he's here tonight, and we can listen to what he has to say and how Michael can sort of inquire a little bit about the things that are going on in the future uh, relative to his industry as well. Reed founded uh, Netflix, um, well-known story for those, and I'm sure he'll recount some of those things as necessary in the program. But uh, Netflix has got now over 12 million members, uh, more than 10 times the number that they had just 10 years ago. And uh, really the other thing that's important about Reed is that he has been a serial entrepreneur founding Pure Software, building it into one of the largest uh, top 50 software companies in the world, eventually acquired by IBM and Rational and then IBM. 
But more importantly, I think Ed, his soul is a social philanthropist and has made immense contribution to the education community, uh, for the state, and I think for society in general, and has always got his antenna out on issues that really make a difference in people's lives. Uh, in this case, uh, with, with Netflix entertainment, which we all need, because we all work too hard. So with that, um, let me welcome both to the stage, thank them both for being here, and I'll pass the microphone off to Michael and have him begin the, the, the conversation with Reed. Thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, it's fun being here with Reed. And uh, uh, I was told uh, at the table that these gatherings some t can be irreverent uh, for a person who has gotten into a lot of trouble writing emails. Um, in the age of Twitter, I'm going to try to be careful and not be too irreverent. Um, but uh, we'll begin. Uh, on, on one thing that I am interested in, uh, amongst many, um, <laughs> it's going to be shorter if it's only one thing. Uh, I've been involved with a lot of movies, Officer and Gentleman, a lot of military movies, and I've never really questioned anybody who was in the Marines that was at Guantanamo in boot camp. So you're running this, this company that is changing the media landscape, but you were still went through boot camp. So what was that? Did that help you do any of this? <laughs> or, I mean, do you still do push-ups and run in the mud and get in trouble? Or, of course, you left the Marines, right? Wikipedia is a wonderful thing, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't get it from Wikipedia. I got it from somebody that works for you. <laughs> an, an anecdote. It was a suggested question, and I thought, Shall, well, we, why shall we clarify the record? Well, you went from the military to the Peace Corps, so obviously something happened at Guantanamo that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> if you went to the White House, it would be a different track, but you went to the Peace Corps. The um, Marine Corps, like um, several of the forces, run officer candidate programs that's a summer for college. Uh, and uh, you can do that uh, without a multi-year commitment, unlike ROTC. Um, and some people who go in uh, figure out that uh, may not be uh, the right model for them. I was one of those. <laughs> so <clears throat> my boot camp was all of six weeks uh, in Virginia, uh, Quantico, and uh, uh, wouldn't qualify uh, for anyone who's actually served as anything but summer camp. Um, so it, it, let, let's be clear on that. Uh, but uh, I did figure out that, uh, you know, picking daisies and teaching children was more my passion. Um, and uh, I ended up, uh, after, right after college, joining the Peace Corps uh, and becoming a high school math teacher in Swaziland. Um, and did it contribute? Um, yeah, I think it really did. Uh, uh, being on your own, you know, as a young person um, in, in the relative middle of nowhere, uh, you know, it's a very maturing experience. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I definitely think about it a lot. And it's definitely steered my uh, philanthropy now that I'm a part-time philanthropist. Uh, I joke with friends, people ask me, why are you so focused on education? You know, why not the environment, global warming, um, all these other areas, very important areas. And I'm like, well, you know, if the Peace Corps assigned me to be a fish farmer, I'd probably be working on water policy right now. You know, and they assigned me to be a teacher. It's a bit random. Um, and I found a real love for that, and so that's, uh, that's kept me involved uh, in the education side. Well, and you're, you're committed to the charter school initiative, which I am as well, in Los Angeles, which is an incredibly important initiative um, if we're going to keep getting qualified people coming into the workforce. Yep. Is that the area that you're mostly concentrating in, 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 this, in philanthropy charter schools? It is when, you know, for uh, at least 50 years, since Sputnik in 1957, um, uh, both politicians and philanthropists have been focused on how to improve public education. Um, and despite, you know, enormous amounts of effort, billions of dollars, not much has really changed. Um, and so that's a, that's a bit of a puzzle. And, and I think what many people have realized is, you know, if you look at the old Soviet Union and you look at the five-year plan, you know, from 1971, um, you say, well, look at all the problems in that five-year plan. I mean, we should have a better five-year plan. 
uh, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, we can say, you know what, it, it didn't actually matter the details of the Soviet 1971 five-year plan. Uh, you could do a little bit better plan, and it didn't really matter. And there's something like that going on with public education, despite all these great ideas, you know, the this, the that, the everything from the open classroom to the technology, it doesn't really change. Um, and then it dawned on me, uh, it, about uh, two years ago, I got selected to serve on Microsoft's board, which has been a great learning experience. And I thought, well, what if this board were publicly elected? So it was 10 of the best politicians in the world. I thought, wow, that, this might not be an effective corporate. What if Netflix board of directors were elected by the general public? What if GE, what if Disney's board were elected by the general public of people who successfully could run for office? Well, you know, you might not get very consistent leadership. And if you didn't have consistent leadership, you know, you too might want a thick union contract because two out of three people you worked for that were appointed by these politically elected boards, you know, were, were dodos. And so what I've come to realize uh, is that the fundamental problem in public education is the locally elected school board. And they're all good people. But what it, gen if you talk to superintendents, you say, what's their job? And if they haven't been drinking, they say educating kids. <laughs> and if they have been drinking, they say maintaining four votes out of seven. That's their job, is maintaining four votes out of seven. And they focus the good ones on really good because of the political churn. And so I, I realized that fundamentally lots of great people are stuck in school districts. And you know, believe it or not, there were lots of great people in Soviet factories trying to make things better. Okay? It's just they were overwhelmed by a system that had very random leadership throughout the system. The average factory leader was a political appointee, not very good. Um, so I, I've come to believe that the problem is the local school boards, the public elected structure, and we're always trying to like put business practices into schools, merit pay, these kinds of things. That's never going to work any more than you know merit pay going into the five-year plan from the 1971 Soviet era would make any difference. It's a governance problem we have, and that's why it's been so resistant to change. And charter schools are the first avenue. Charter schools are nonprofit public schools. Any of you can go form them, just form a nonprofit, get a charter, and educate kids. And in nonprofits, like for profits, you have self perpetuating governance. You select the new board members, um, and it keeps continuity of vision. And it's not that every for profit leader is perfect or every nonprofit leader is perfect. But on average, the quality of leadership there is much higher than in school districts because they're selected again by people who can win elections. And so it's an electoral problem. Uh, and the solution is to grow charter schools. That's now about 4% of Californian children to 10% to 20% to 30%. And many of the great leaders that we have in current school districts will come over to work on the charter side where they work in a nonprofit governance. And if anyone has worked in governance, and in nonprofits, they can tell you it's a huge difference. The nonprofit is so much more uh, nimble, effective, and they're focused on a continuous vision, not zigzagging back and forth, which is what happens with elected school boards. And so it's a, a 30 or 40 year uh, mission to grow the charter. It's not going to happen overnight to grow the charter school sector to be more and more of uh, all public education. So this is perfect. You said at least enough in there to give me three more questions. <laughs> so you've been a private company in two of your companies, and, and Netflix, and now you're a public company. And everything you said about boards and governance, there are those people in Washington that would push you, push us, push people, public companies, to have boards that are basically what you described as the bane of public education. In other words, aren't you now that you're a public company in Netflix forced because of the environment in Washington to address elections of board members that are more politically diverse, let's say, than what would have been in previous life? And how does that, how do you deal with that? Well, you're right that American, probably global business, um, is in disrepute because so many people are out of work and so many people's 401k is down, are down by 30%, 40%. And the fundamental confidence um, that growth and prosperity you know, will continue is weakened or, or even is gone in places. And that creates a lot of anxiety in the public 
And what politicians do, if they're good, is they channel anxiety. They figure out, hey, if people are anxious about this, I'll capitalize on it, catalyze it, and I'll win votes. Um, and if you don't, because you're an intellectual politician, well, then you're pushed to the side, and the people who catalyze the public, you know, rise. Um, so it's just a natural Darwinian system. It's not fair to blame the politicians. It's the system that we have. And right now, there's certainly a way. I mean, thank God we're not bankers, you know, because, you know, to read the, the national dialogue, bankers are the evil force on the planet, and I don't believe that that's true. Um, there are certainly some things around boards, uh, you know, and around Sarbanes-Oxley that are inefficient and are, you know, sapping some of our strength. But I don't think they're going to stop um, innovation. You know, the, the innovation that we've seen, you know, over the past, uh, you know, 50 years in Silicon Valley is just tremendous. Um, and between, you know, the growth of bandwidth, uh, uh, Julius Jankowski was talking about, you know, 100 megabits to 100 million homes in the U.S. by 2020. That's eight years away. It's nothing, you know, nine, ten years away. Uh, you know, it's going to happen pretty soon. Um, and then, you know, Moore's Law is continuing to deliver a little bit more now in multiprocessors than in single cores. Uh, but, you know, the fundamental drivers of huge innovation are, are there. And so um, is it a less friendly regulatory environment? It is. Um, how material would it be? Not a ton. I had a, uh, a board that was voted the worst board in America. So I'm an, I'm an expert on this. Um, <laughs> I'd we grew, to we I'd grew 1,800 times. We were number one in every part of the business we were in. But because we had a priest who supposedly was not savvy in business, although he ran at Jesuit University, and we had a head of school, uh, elementary school, who was not business savvy. She only taught kids which somehow Disney somehow was involved with. And because we had an actor, Sidney Poitier, who must be an idiot because he's an actor, we were deemed the worst board in America. So, of course, as I'm supposed to be interviewing you. Why I'm going into this, I don't know. But I'm a little aggravated. This is interesting. I'm still aggravated about it. So what did I, <laughs> so what did I stupidly do? I tried to accommodate those that were critical, and I went from the worst board to the best board. And of course, the best board then decided I may not be the best CEO, <laughs> but, but, but it was so illogical that a couple of, and we never, by the way, had an ethical problem, an accounting problem, nothing. But we were a, 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 a known company so sometimes the environment in Washington creates for a public company things that you do that does stifle innovation because you're spending all your time. Now, you haven't had this problem yet because you've been growing well. Yep. But take a year where you're flat, and you will find that you're flat because you become idiots from being very smart on your board. So uh, what am I talking about here? Anyway, uh, the other thing that you discussed was five-year plans. So I love five-year plans, because I never knew what they even were until I hired a CFO from Marriott who knew five-year plans, and then I became an expert in five-year plans. So do you do five-year plans? We do not. Do you do three-year plans? We do not. Do you do any planning? Barely. <laughs> it is not possible that you don't do planning. You, you must sit around and say, because you're a public company, uh, next year we are going to grow X percentage in net income if we can, and we're going to have a return on equity to such and such, and the year after that we're going to do, you don't do any of that? We do some forecasting. Um, but uh, what we really push on is staying nimble. Um, and so we put an incredible premium on being able to replan or reforecast nearly constantly. So we model, we think of it as a rolling forecast. Um, many companies will fix an annual forecast and then, you know, compare to an annual plan. And the, the problem is in technology, the world doesn't move in annual increments. You know, it, um, you know in, a, in a studio business, you know, there have been six major studios for 60 years, something like that. 
you know, that's a little different. In technology business, what's selected for is, is being able to turn on a dime, some uh, new competitive entrance, some new opportunity, move really quickly. And if your company is oriented around compliance to a plan, if that's the value system in which one gets rewarded, you get what you optimized for, which is plan compliance, as opposed to rapid shifting. Another example in that is we don't have bonuses. You know, almost every company has bonuses. Well, you know, uh, one time about uh, three years ago, uh, we had a bunch of extra money one quarter, um, and uh, we said to marketing, you know, do you want to spend it? We can get a lot more subscribers. Sounds like a good thing. And our head of marketing, Leslie, says, you know, I don't think it's a wise use of the money right now because uh, on the margin what we would buy is not that great. Uh, and I thought, my God, thank God we don't bonus her on subscriber growth. Okay, because once you introduce that personal, you know, uh, she has to think, well, I'm going to give up a bigger bonus because it's the right thing for the company, and now she doesn't have to think about it. You're she, never going to be a banker. Yeah. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> That's true in many dimensions, Michael. <laughs> but um, so we do do a lot of stock options. So we're all aligned around stock. But in terms of cash bonus or, you know, uh, specific indi individual performance, we're very much trying to align the comp system around um, doing well for the company. And so in a number of those ways, we're a specialist firm that's adapted to a rapidly changing market. But if somebody, well, wait, wait a second. Go on. Let's say somebody can convince Warner Brothers for very little money to license you uh, uh, a first-run film in the streaming business you're now in, and they've convinced the powers at Warner Brothers to forego HBO mm -hmm. and just concentrate on Netflix. The person that achieved that fantastic result for your company is named Yahweh. <laughs> well, no, but there may be somebody that gets that done. That you would you would take her to lunch. What would you do? <laughs> I mean, there are you're, in my you're... experience there are people that have done extraordinary things beyond the course of being just an excellent executive. And a bonus to that person for doing something extraordinary ripples through the company that being nimble can be financially rewarding. But you have the other, now this is refreshing because it's a completely opposite point of view that I would have had. To be yeah. Uh, so if we had, and we have lots of them who do an extraordinary event that, you know, let's say, pulled off some great licensing deal. Miraculous. Because unless you get the rights to first-run product for movies for your streaming business, isn't that a, um, an issue in growing that business at a certain point in time? Let's come to that in a second. That's a okay. great topic. But on I the just bonus one, if I could solve that, I would like a bonus. If, some, if somebody does if enormous results, you. We give them more compensation the next year. Okay, so the, it's the expectation of a raise. Do you take, well that's unfortunately, the bad thing about that, that's embedded. Yes. What if the year after that they get brain dead? You take it away? Yeah. Really? Yeah. And they stay in the company? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Let's so wait a second, well, before we get to, to, to the business, we're now in your culture, because yeah. your culture is interesting. Uh, I hear that any executive, I, this must be apocryphal, but any executive can take as long a vacation as they want. True or false? As long as it's less than two days, that's true. <laughs> no, is it, can they? Because hey, um, that's clever, because that means just what you said. Nobody will ever take a vacation. Well, unless the they CEO does. Because they want to impress, nah, your royalty. They'll, they'll say, I can take any vacation I want, and I don't, and therefore I am better. Is that the strategy? <laughs> what is the strategy about an executive being able to pick a vacation at any length they desire? So our vacation is not just for executives. Uh, if we hire a, a 100K engineer who's had a couple of years of experience and is you know, very good at what they do, they and the uh, executives uh, and me uh, it's unlimited vacation. Unlimited or limited? Unlimited vacation. Now, in practice, you think, well, that's strange. Well, if they're going for six months, you're going to... 
so long. It, it kind of depends on the person, doesn't it? Because there are a few people you've met who are so good that even half time you would keep them. Right? Not many at six months at the extreme case. Most and of so, those that I've met are probably on drugs by that point. Yeah. <laughs> They're gone. The, Twitter, please don't. Please. Well, we're, well, we're, please. <laughs> See, I knew. I knew. They really, that, that was a, really a joke. Well, we're trying are there to focus enough characters on in Twitter to say it's a joke? <laughs> All right, never mind. Sorry. It, what we try to focus on is what people get done. So uh, th this came about because we said, well, let's see, we don't make our salaried staff clock in. Of course, people say, of course not. They don't, you know. I said, well, then we don't really know if they're working 9 to 5 or 5 to 9. Different weeks, some are working 5 to 9, some are working 9 to 5. And that's a 2x variation in hours. So if we don't know, you know, how many hours a day someone is working, why do we care whether they take two weeks or three weeks vacation? you know, in 52 weeks. I mean, you know, that's an irrelevant bit of uh, knowledge. But do you think you, you, you made last year like $115 million in net profit, you probably did 30% more this year or something. But when you're making, in your growth projector, you're gonna be making, you're gonna be much, much bigger. Isn't that a strategy for a small company? If you become a, can you maintain that kind of strategy if you get bigger and bigger? Is this an interim strategy? I mean, is it like we bought uh, InfoSeek at Disney? Remember that company? I do. They were like, there was Yahoo and then there was InfoSeek. And we ruined it pretty good, but we, we bought it. <laughs> and I came up to speak to the group at InfoSeek, and all they wanted to know was whether they were still going to have daily options or weekly options or whatever it was. Massages were still going to be offered, free lunches. I didn't know how to answer any of that, which is probably why we failed. Don't sometimes, sometimes these the small companies that are built on this great entrepreneurial spirit and they become big, do they, do they have to adjust? Do you think about that? In the mid 80s, my sister worked for Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, if any people know here. Uh, and what was amazing is at 10,000 employees, they were totally on fire. At 20,000, at 40,000, at 80,000 employees, they were just ripping the world apart. New products, incredible stuff, cleaning up on their competitors. At about 100,000 employees, they got sick. Market sh shifted on them around mini computers. And by the time they got to 150,000, which was their peak, um, you know, they were a, a fallen giant and, and in revenues shrinking and losses growing. And the reason I s talk about that is because you can fail at any size. So there's the obvious one, which is the big company. It got to 100,000 people before it got like terrible to work at. On the other hand, you know, there's plenty of 50 and 100 person companies that are awful to work at. You know, very autocratic, crazily run, you know, just manic. And so disease in a company can set in at 50 people or at 100,000. Is it a little bit harder as you grow? Probably. But do you change strategies as you become a different company? We like have. you change products? Absolutely. What we've realized, um, when we went public seven years ago, we had a standard vacation policy. And we got rid of it along the way. See, for a technology company, when you look at threats, um, threats, I mean, how did Sun fail? Did they fail because they had three weeks versus two weeks vacation? No. They failed because of a lack of innovation. They should have been Amazon's cloud. They had all the resources, all the ability in, in the year two. They could, didn't come up with it. They failed to innovate. And so what kills companies in our world is failure to innovate. Now, if that's true, then as a shareholder, you want to make sure a company is completely aligned around innovation. Because every significant company in Silicon Valley that's died has from lack of innovation. So it's you so say, funny. we take all these other risks, for example, loose vacation policy, massages. I mean, we don't do massages, but Google does that well, you know. So uh, ping to, pong. to focus on innovation. You have ping pong? We have ping pong. Right. So, you know, it's a focus on innovation that is core, not because we like it, although we do, it's because it's the right shareholder strategy to run loose, make mistakes, but do not fail uh, to invent. Because when you do that, again, you become Sun Microsystems, a company that you know, was legendary for two decades.
It's so funny because I have the, the same goal with 180 opposite degree point of view. At companies that I've been at to innovate, and now granted we're innovating within a proscenium, mm -hmm. meaning the movie business is the movie business. There's still a beginning, middle, and end, and the television, you know, et cetera. I mean, it's, there is a world that we know exists. We're not changing the, basically, the storytelling concept. But if we don't, I have found that if we don't make sure that we have this strong financial box around this organization, that we don't have people who keep their offices clean, I have found the executives that live in a mess don't innovate very well. I found when I talked to Steven Spielberg, he's very organized. He is not a mad scientist. He is a, a, so every company I have worked at where it's been successful, it's been, uh, the structure is, is essential. Mm -hmm. There is a absolute vacation plan. There is an absolute bonus plan. There is an absolute mommy and daddy structure mm -hmm. so that the kids can play in a confined playroom. <laughs> and you're talking about 180 degrees the opposite, which How, I don't quite believe. How'd that work out with InfoSeek? InfoSeek, InfoSeek was McKinsey's fault. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Well, on that we can agree. No, here's what happened. When we went by our instincts, we did great. InfoSeek was exactly, this is the story you actually mentioned at dinner. This is how it evolved. We buy InfoSeek because we want to be a relevant company. We weren't Jerry Levin buying AOL, we bought little InfoSeek. Uh, and then Goldman Sachs came up with this scheme I think invented a few blocks from here probably, that you can have a tracking stock, something I'd never heard of and still don't understand. Okay, because we had five-year plans and we had strategic plan, we'll have a tracking stock, that's sexy. And then Goldman Sachs said, you have to have a well-known CEO to run this tracking stock. And I looked around the company and the most well-known executive I had was the guy who ran ESPN, because he was like kind of famous. And so I said, well, we have one well-known guy. And so I said, Steve Bornstein, you have to come run InfoSeek. He said, I don't know anything. I said, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Goldman Sachs said, you have to do it. And you're a very good executive. You get to work on time. You don't take all your vacation. <laughs> so, so Steve moves to California reluctantly, because I made him. And uh, what does he do? He hires 30 people from McKinsey, who are all 12 years old. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I see like a duck pond walking by every day. There's Steve, and there are all these little ducks following him. And they don't know anything either. And meanwhile, we have an out-of-control company up here that's worrying about massages. So. Then, I'm talking to Barry Diller, and what's the guy's name, Gross, that had a... Bill Gross. Bill Gross had this company, and they were doing uh, paid search. So I was in the men's room. Steve Bornstein was near me. I said, how about paid search? And he says, McKinsey says, it's not Disney-esque. Well, if anybody said to me something's not Disney-esque, my whole job was to protect the Disney brand. I said, okay. I left. What, $80 billion later? Google, we could have had paid search before Google was even thought of, which resulted in a very important, as we discussed before, policy for Disney, which is no decisions made at the urinal. And a lot of people have corporate mottos. That became the Disney corporate motto. <laughs> but how do we get on this? How many of you have ever uh, seen the Netflix culture deck on the web? All right, fair amount. Great. I think we'll have to add a slide, which is no decisions made in the <laughs> army. I think it's a great. No, well, the fact of the matter is, as you know, being the CEO, 
you're going to get in your car and somebody who's been trying to get to you for three weeks who has this brilliant idea sees you. They run up to you. They tell you the idea. All you want to do is get home. You got to get home before your kids get to bed. You got to pack. You're going away. You say yes, no, maybe. You just get out of the way. That's a decision at the urinal. It just happens to be your car. You really should bring the person to your office and think about what he's talking about. So it really had a deeper meaning than, than the urinal, and so we'll go off of that. Anyway, I don't know what we were talking about before, but let's get back to Netflix. Um, you created, well, every, people here probably know, but you should tell me, what drove you I do know the answer, but I'm interested to hear it again. Maybe it's not even the truth. What drove you to start Netflix? What was the single two things that did it, or the one thing that did it? In 95 or 96, um, I was living in uh, La Honda, for those of you who know it, and uh, pretty much in the boonies. Uh, and I rented a copy of Apollo 13, which is a great movie, and I forgot about it. Um, and when I eventually went to return it, uh, it was a $40 late fee, because back in the VHS days, that's what you got. Um, and uh, it just, you know, irritated me a lot. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where I thought, am I really going to tell my wife about it, or am I going to lie to her? And <laughs> that's a bad feeling when you ask yourself that question. So uh, then in 97, um, uh, Pure Software, the company I was running, got acquired. And I was thinking about other ideas uh, for companies. Um, and I ran to one of my favorite venture capitalists and told him how we were going to rent VHS cassettes by mail. And it was a, a $10 round trip because it's $4 to mail a VHS. You know, and he looked at me and he said, you know, you're a good engineer. But you have no idea what you're doing. And uh, so uh, I thought about it for a little while, talked to a few more people. And then someone told me about DVD, which had not yet been launched, and how it was a CD. And I ran out to get some CDs, because I thought, oh my god, these are going to be really small. And I weighed it, and it weighs you know, 0.6 of an ounce, so you could mail it for one stamp. And so I stuffed a bunch of CDs, and they couldn't buy DVDs then. Put them, mailed them to myself, and then I had to wait for 24 hours to see them come home, uh, to see are they going to be all shattered into bits along with the, my idea. Uh, and then, you know, the next day, 3 o'clock, the postman arrives, and I rip open the envelopes, and the first one's in good shape, and the second one's in good shape, and the third one's in good shape, and I'm like, this sucker is going to work! Uh, and uh, that was the beginning of Netflix, as I thought. We could mail DVDs, you know, around the planet, um, you know, roll up. I knew instinctually that blockbuster-style real estate was very inefficient, because they had tens of thousands of sites. Uh, stores, you know, that only served a small neighborhood, and if you could do that all by mail. And I also knew that, when well, knew, I believed, that it didn't make sense for Amazon to enter because you return 100 percent, you've got to have local distribution, and Amazon was going to roll up on e-commerce, and I didn't want to get in the way of that. So it was finding a segment that wasn't natural for them to expand into. And often in business, at and least... And by the way, now you send $700 million a year to the U.S. Post Office. We do. We employ a lot of postal workers. So oh, that's right. Yeah, no, it's a big, big, uh, big benefit for them. Um, and what we realized is when you're growing a business, you don't want the biggest market that's possible because then you have the biggest competitors. You know, you could say, well, relational databases, that's a big market. But if you try to compete head-to-head -head with Oracle, it's very hard to make, make it. So and how do you feel pushing Hollywood video into bankruptcy? Uh, <laughs> having Blockbuster reduce uh, its stores by about 25% just, I think, last year, mm -hmm. um, having Blockbuster spend $500 million trying to replicate some of the things you're doing. I mean, you've, you've, you've uh, disrupted, uh, I wouldn't say they're long term, it's not like disrupting you know, Bloomingdale's in New yeah. York, but you've disrupted, so is, that's well, if, if you That's and an I are uh, yes. running together or we're in two boats sailing against each other, you know, it's fun to win. I, I don't wish you any harm, and you don't wish me any harm, but, you know, you compete to win. And we, from the beginning, have been to compete to win. Okay? We're not against Blockbuster. They're all nice people. They're very thoughtful. They're straightforward. They're super high integrity. Um, but our goal is to offer a better service that consumers prefer us to them. 
and that eventually that does result in them closing. And All right, you, so now, okay, okay. <laughs> Sometimes you would like your competitor to be harmed, but okay. Um, so now there's a thing called Redbox. Mm. And Redbox rents videos for a dollar, and they're in 15 or 16,000 locations, which is actually more than Blockbuster. And they're now not threatening your whole business, but they certainly are competitive against your 24-hour business, instant gratification at Walmart and so forth. So now you're on the other end of what could be somebody's you know, shotgun. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, if um, you had been on Blockbuster's board, um, and we were there, very thankful that you weren't, uh, and I'm sure that you would have helped them. Uh, in we went, uh, we launched our service in 1999. We went public in 2002, and Blockbuster didn't start competing against us until 2004. So five years after launch. Okay, so uh, that was too long to wait. However. Once you wait that long, it may well be better not to enter. Because by that time, you know, we had a couple hundred million in revenue, we had a big balance sheet, we were, you know, going to be really hard to profitably dislodge. And what they should have done is wait and say, what's the next thing that's going to come along in video rental, and we're going to have to nail the next wave. And then, right about then, Redbox was just starting the $1 kiosk. They were starting with McDonald's. Um, and you could start to see some real traction if you took the time to watch the number of transactions, this kind of thing. Uh, and what they could have done, they spent 500 million against us, and they hurt us, but they didn't make any money. Uh, they lost a lot. And what they could have done is invest that in kiosks where they had a natural advantage because you got to service the machines and they already had a lot of store employees. But by the time that Redbox really started getting traction, Blockbuster had spent all of their money against us. And they hadn't had the discipline to husband their resources and just wait a little bit to the next big innovation. Um, and they could have been Redbox, and they could have been. Particularly if you saw us, it's like Coca-Cola <coughs> and their Coke dispensers. If they had a Blockbuster dispenser, yep. you would have immediate faith that they were doing it right because they were Blockbuster. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, that. it's a. It, have you it, told them this? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> I think well, Yoko would, would it, it admit at the time, but the, it's hard. You know, there's a lot of false threats. I'm sure you saw a lot of false threats of people who say, oh, the Internet's going to end your business or something, or, you know, and then there's some real threats. And a lot of the art of management is separating the false threats from the real threats. Well, also, some of the real threats, if you take over and own that threat, jeopardizes your existing business. The studios have had that problem consistently because, I mean, you take Disney. Disney, when I got there, didn't want to put out its classics in home video at all because they were making $15 million a year on the release of Pinocchio. And so we did an experiment. We put Pinocchio out in the very early days of home video, and we made $100 million, which would have taken us 120 years to make on the distribution, because that $15 million, by the way, was revenue, not, not profit. So you do sit in a lot of meetings, and I'm sure Blockbuster must have thought of it and said, we don't want to jeopardize our existing business, not realizing they were really jeopardizing their existing business by not jeopardizing their business. So you now have a similar situation, and it seems to me what you've done, which is quite brilliant, is decided that streaming video, video, subscription video, movies, will be the future in some way, shape, or form of viewing, home viewing. Is that basically correct before you get into the technology of how that all works? Um, who made the movie Wall Street with Michael Douglas? It wasn't you guys. No. No. But you remember that scene in... Um but you told me you would only mention movies that I made. <laughs> <laughs> or that I wish you made. So you, you remember he's on the beach and he's got like this brick, right? Yes. And, but it was like, oh my God, he's on the beach, Doc. So that was cell phone 1986. Ten years later, 
cell phone 1996, just about the first Palm Pilots were coming out. There weren't phones, but you could get those StarTac Motorola's. You could like barely cram in your pocket. You go ahead another 10 years to 2006 and you get the first iPhone. And you know, by 2016, it's gonna be amazing, the cell phone that you have. And over 30 years, it became pretty obvious that landline minutes were gonna decline and decline and decline, and cell phone minutes were gonna grow and grow and grow. So uh, you look at this in computing, you look at this in many markets have that, you know, sort of, wow, you see something in a movie and you're like, wow, that's just going to grow and grow and grow, you know, for 30 years. And you can build big companies if you've got that kind of tailwind. It's uh, Warren Buffett's big snowball. So uh, when we look at it 10, 12 years ago when we started Netflix, you know, the internet was still AOL dial-up. But, you know, we looked back, you know, over the prior, you know, uh, from the, you know, 9.6 modems to the 14.4 to the 56K, and you get a lot of respect for Moore's Law being in this industry. We realize, wow, networks are just going to grow. And even though we have dial-up 56K as the, the peak when we first started, we're like, networks are going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And you know what's going to happen? All video is going to become click and watch internet video. Everything. Just like everything's going to become cell phone minutes, you know, over 50 years, not over 10 years. Um, but we could use DVD by mail as our network substitute. You know, DVD by mail is actually a very high bandwidth network with just some big latency, 24 hours latency. So <laughs> it's a single big packet. Um, so we look at it and said, that's how we stimulate the network. We get to build the UI, all the choosing, um, and build this out. Uh, and so for 10 years, Netflix has grown, driven by the internet, basically internet commerce growing, um, because you could finally get DSL, sucky DSL, and better DSL, and then cable. Like, you know, I get home, I get 20 megabit, you know, Comcast cable, it's phenomenal. And uh, Jankowski's talking about 100 megabits at the end of this decade. So um, through all that time, you're going to see everything, satellite, all the stuff, all is going to go to internet. There'll be little pockets of deep rural Vermont, Alaska that have satellite, but basically it's going to become a complete internet world over 10 or 20 or 30 years. I don't know exactly how many. Well, when you spot that kind of dislocation where the fundamental transmission mechanism is going to change and it's going to go to a pure on-demand click and watch model for everything, you say there's got to be a big opportunity in that. And what's happening is the internet is uh, creating a revolution in distribution. And we're one of the companies that's going to benefit from it. There'll be many others, and we'll have a lot of competitors. Um, but we're on track for what we thought. The DVD got bigger and better than we ever thought was going to happen. We didn't really think the DVD would be as successful as it was. Um, but that has given us a great tailwind. And the stunning thing is our DVD shipments are continuing to grow now as fast as they've ever been growing. Um, so we got you know, a long time to go with DVD. Probably 20 years from now, we'll still be shipping DVD. But the streaming is growing on top of that. And it's fundamentally focused on this click and watch model. And again, most video is going to become click and watch, like YouTube, like Netflix, like Hulu. Um, ESPN 360 is doing great work. Uh, and you know, it's all going to move to the internet. You're going to see web browsers, uh, IE, Chrome, Firefox, all built into televisions. You know, and now you say, well, that sucks. I don't want a web browser like I use today in my television. Well, you're right. But you're forgetting, if you think that, of what a web browser will be like in five years. You okay, know? so then I will make my case as your strategic advisor here yeah. um, at how you make it work. Because when you get to that point, which you're almost at, it's about the content. And Yes, on the first sale doctrine, you can go to Costco or wherever and buy a thousand DVDs and then go rent them out any way you want. But in the streaming world, you have to have the rights. So to compete with cable or HBO, pay television, subscription pay television, somebody in the streaming world is going to step up and get those rights. And then eventually, those rights are going to be less important, and the distri distribution company that is in that business will start making its own original product. Sopranos, whatever. So when does the point come, unless you can tell me there's another way to do it, 
that you walk into Paramount because library footage is only going to get you so far, in my opinion. So you're going to have to have current films, current television shows, or make your own. Uh, so you walk into Paramount and you say, we will pay more for your 20 last films on my Netflix subscription service than HBO or Showtime or Stars. When does that happen? Because I think they're waiting for that. I think they're sitting there saying, I can't wait, because they're having trouble now with studios selling the way they used to sell their films to HBO, because HBO discovered that original product, actual original exclusive product, actually is more exciting to their customers than non-exclusive retreads. And would your advice be that we're better paying a lot for the movies against those firms, or to invest in scripted original content like HBO did? What would Depends who you are. If you're Rupert Murdoch, and you're willing to bet the company, as he has often, buying the NFL, doing things like that to create the Fox Television Network, you go in to whichever company is on their knees, and you make an offer they can't turn down. Because that will be cheaper for you in the short term than trying to create your own product in enough volume to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Or, you could shortcut that whole thing and say, we're going to sit on the sidelines on that for a while, because that just does, I can't borrow enough money to make that work and keep a good balance sheet. I am going to make a continuing flow of original content, not movies, not Avatar, but Sopranos, Sex and the City, Mad Men, whatever it is, to tell my customers Maybe I'll only have a window that's a month or 12 hours, but I'm going to tell my customers if they want original product, they get it here first. But if you don't do one of the two of those things, somebody else will. Now, today there was an announcement, wasn't there, that HBO Go.com, they're going to stream. And there was an announcement yesterday that Warner Brothers has now made a deal with Redbox for a 28 delay, so everybody seems to be zoning in on some way to solve this problem. Okay, so what's your strategy? Because <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm just, I'm just having soul before and understanding a little bit about it. The competitor for cable isn't really Netflix, it's the internet. It's uh, a combination of ESPN 360, YouTube, uh, Netflix, Hulu, and a million other video sources. Um, they're also your competitor, all those people. They're also our competitor, but in total, um, the internet solution uh, of video is the competitor to the cable video or satellite video package to the 60 bucks a month. Um, we are a narrow part of that, that's movies and TV shows, and it's a much closer to pay television, as you said. So we have two strategies. Um, our preferred strategy is to carry those companies' product. So we distribute stars today. We distribute a number of Showtime shows, but not current season. Uh, we don't yet distribute Epix or HBO. But our view is we should write them large checks and carry the content. However, at the end of the day, they may decide that they're not willing to do that in which case we get forced into trying to bid against them. But that ends up in a bidding war because it's not easy for them to not get that content. And so it's not clear that, you know, what the success strategy of that will be either. So our primary strategy, like we do with stars, is to carry the content and then write them big checks. Because what's amazing about Netflix... But doesn't that stars Disney deal come to an end? And then you won't be able to get the Disney product? You're used I don't to, know this for a fact. You're I don't. used to a world that all deals come to an end, whether we, whether we can renew it. You know, that's always an uh, open question. What's wonderful about Hollywood is everyone negotiates in public. So they say a lot of things like, Netflix will never get X because it's supposed to drive the price up. So for sufficient money, anything can happen, right? 
because it makes business sense. Right? So, you know, it's not a question of can it happen or not. It's, you know, will there be a price overlap between what we can pay and what, you know, the different studios and stars, you know, and other pay TV firms want. And, you know, we'll have to feel our way along on that. That really depends. But the price discovery that's done, you know, so much in, in Hollywood is done in public, you know, in many other business sectors is handled differently. But, you know, we get used to that. Um, coming back to, uh, you know, the core theme I'm not is, quite sure I got that, but okay. Okay. We, ha we have to get enough content so that our, and, and we're getting more and more content uh, every quarter so that our subscribers You are growing are, tremendously in, in, I mean, exponentially in your streaming business, are you not? Uh, it's not exponential, but it's growing really fast, yes. That's right. Okay. That's right. And what is, for, what is, what is it that is making it grow? Uh, well, there's, uh, is it the technology, know, you, you, or is it you, what you're you, putting out there? Again, you've got a, a long-term tailwind of broadband growth. Broadband is getting faster, better. People are using it more. That's a 30-year trend, 40-year trend. We're in the first decade of that. Second, um, video stores are closing. So that helps Netflix. So if you think of Redbox and Netflix, they both compete with a video store. Redbox goes after the new release oriented business. Netflix goes after the catalog oriented business. In combination, there's not much business for video stores. And once they lose half their revenue, they close. And then the other half of the revenue comes to both Redbox and Netflix. So actually, we're not very competitive with Redbox because they're pure new release focused. Um, but that's helping us grow. And then streaming, we've got more and more content and more and more usage on the streaming. Uh, and that's also but helping is that, us. Is it the novelty of the streaming still, like YouTube, is still kind of cats playing the piano or okay? Or is there something in what you're streaming that is attracting people to watch it? Well, YouTube streaming is uh, going really exponential. I mean, it's phenomenal, the amount of growth, and they've got more and more commercial content. Um, they say they're going to do high, movies now. Of high-produced movies. Um, you know, they're doing ad-supported content. And they're very good at it. You know, it's an advertising company, and that's what they're really good at. Uh, so, you know, you might uh, dismissively think of it as cats on a skateboard or, you know, dog on a skateboard, but uh, it's way beyond that. It's a huge, monster, global success, and the growth is not slowing down. Again, it's internet video. It's, you know, cell phone minutes have just grown, you know, for 30 years. But when is it going to matter what the content is? Does it ever matter? in this new world of ubiquity? You bet it matters. We've got great content. We've got... Well, that's what I'm trying to find out. What is it? Yeah, we've got all the stars. So we've got about 17,000 movies and television shows. Everything from 30 Rock to all of the stars' output, including the Disney output. Um, so tremendous content there. All of these independent films. Uh, you know, to watch my kids, they're just, uh, you know, on the Xbox flicking through the content to watch. And, you know, they're... So you don't have any... There is no issue on getting content, as long as you get the cable services. The issue on content is only money, which is we need to write bigger and bigger checks. The bigger the subscriber advice gets, the bigger checks we can write. How about the cost of bandwidth? Is that an issue? No, it's falling to zero. It's incredibly small. Well, no, you're always going to have that. I mean, isn't bandwidth now uh, subject to uh, the fossil fuel age, the cost of oil, power? You still need power to send that out. Uh, but the costs decrease at roughly at Moore's Law. So, you know, they've come down and down and down and down. But so if the, oil the prices go up, is that going to continue? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, not, it's, just not, uh, it's not driven by petrochemical costs and, uh, or fiber or anything else. So uh, think of the Internet. It's just going to grow and grow and grow for a very long time. Well, so now, now I'm coming down. Now you're convincing me that the solution is original, semi, or exclusive product that only you have. Because well, if I can get everything you describe everywhere, other than you being faster and quicker technologically, what, what do you have to offer to me that some other guy in another company figures out a better way to do? Well, if the solution is a I'm an advocate of content, by the way, in case you haven't <laughs> gathered that. If the solution is original scripted entertainment, then we need you as CEO. No, I'm saying you go, you, well, that's a good idea, too. Uh, <laughs> when you joined but, Disney, that was about the same market cap. Our market cap's $3 billion, so it's about the same market cap. And my strategy was 
100 percent content. I could take vacation, and you could take Netflix. No, but, to 80, I, but I'm trying, eighty billion dollars. But I'm trying to understand. You you've created a uh, recommendation tool. Yep. Which is a which you did with this a million dollar prize, which every I'm sure knows about it, a prize for anybody who come up with a better recommendation tool. And everywhere I read, it's a fantastic tool. You, that was a brilliant thing yep. to do. You got for a million dollars what you would have spent fifty million dollars getting. Yep. And there are those that say, uh, if Amazon only had that good a tool, because the Amazon tool is nowhere near as good. It doesn't really track what you bought. Now I'm over my head, but it's not as good. So you've built a better mousetrap. I'm going to go back to my, my strategy. You technically have figured out how to do it well. You figured out how to pay for it relatively inexpensively. But what happens when the guy next door takes advantage of the fact that you're all on vacation, this unlimited vacation, <laughs> and gets the same or better mousetrap? Is there not a point in time that you must consider original games, I'm not just talking about movies, originality and exclusivity? Or does that never come in this world of infinite uh, opportunity? Um, it's something we think about a lot. It, it, it may be that, you know, in our first 20 or 30 million subscribers that uh, we can get by on this non-exclusive. What we're doing now is carrying other people's content from stars from Disney, paying them a lot of money, and then putting a really good user interface, personalization, recommendations, integrating it with DVD, getting it on to, uh, you know, Samsung televisions, getting it on to Xbox and PS3 and Nintendo Wii and it may be that there's enough value, but that to get beyond some number, 20 or 30 million subscribers, uh, we'll need to do some of that. We'll have to so feel you, our way along. So you can see the problem I'm having. I am making 30 uh, shows a year for the internet. Yep. And I am convinced, you know, uh, we started with Prom Queen and we're doing all these. And I've got a partner who's a, a, a cable telephony company in Canada. And I go around from company to company saying, I've arrived. How much are you going to pay? And the answer I get back is, no, you don't understand. This is a new world. How much are you going to pay me? What are you going to pay me for promotion? What are you going to pay me for the front page? I said, wait a second. You need me. And they say, no, you need me. So we're going to have to have some referee somewhere <laughs> down the line that's going to decide you know, is it the singer or the song? Is it the priest or is it the Catholic Church? Is it the uh, composer or is it the, you know, uh, Green Day? Well, that may be both. Maybe that's the answer. So that's what I'm trying to probe. And it sounds like you haven't decided completely yet where you have to come out on this. There are no content owners that we deal with where we say, you have to pay us to be on Netflix. So every content owner, like for Prom Queen, uh, we pay money for things like Prom Queen, and we should probably carry that. What's unique? Are you free tomorrow at 10 o'clock for a meeting? <laughs> we can meet People, in the by the, way, by the way, two years ago when we started this adventure in making, because I just thought it would be interesting to make product mm -hmm. for this, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making it for... You know, 99 percent of the people in America are still watching their entertainment on the television set. Mm -hmm. So this, all this growth is still ahead. But I want to be there when it happens. And two years ago, I will say, when I went from you know, the Yahoo's to Microsoft, all the companies, it was what I just described. Everybody is uh, now returns my phone call. So it's gotten a little people are starting to believe that that, 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 that content has some meaningful place here. Okay, I think we can open this up for questions. Um, so I'll just point, and there's microphones right over there behind you. There's, now these will be the real questions. Yeah. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> Josh Walker, a uh, question for Reed. Uh, is one of the many entrepreneurs that has completely ripped off your vacation policy and various other ideas in your culture deck, I'd like to know how it got created. How did your culture uh, get created from scratch, from, uh, from the beginning? 
we were uh, a couple days ago working on a, a different slide deck, but about an aspect of Netflix. And uh, one of our newer executives said, well, God, this is painful and this is hard to work on. And how long did you guys work on the culture deck? And one of the other executives that's uh, been there from the beginning was like, oh my God, you have no idea how many hours how many you know, company-wide offsites, how many executive offsites, how much uh, successive revision, both into the development of the ideas and the communication behind them. Um, so you know, I really, we decided to, to publish that deck for two reasons. One was to help candidates make sure that you know, they thought they were a good fit for Netflix because you know, we're not for everyone. Um, so the second reason was is we wanted it as a, as a gift to all the entrepreneurs who didn't have to start from scratch. Uh, and I'm sure that what we'll find is people, maybe in this room, will take uh, what we you know, have contributed uh, and over the next five or ten years, uh, they'll take it to the next level um, because it's constantly like that. I mean, we profited so greatly at Netflix from our experiences you know, uh, working at Sun and Oracle and, you know, just a, a SGI, amazing companies in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, then we built on that foundation. Watching Google is stunning. I mean, Google is just doing amazing work in terms of organizing things differently. You know, they, they mostly don't believe in management. They believe that on balance, management creates more problems than it does solutions. And so they make managers have 30 or 40 direct reports so they have no time to manage so they don't get in the way. Um, and it's been enormously successful for their inventive culture. Uh, so, you know, what we love about uh, Google, they're not the same as us, we're not trying to do that, uh, but that they're pushing the envelope, they're organizing in radical new ways. And it's when there's diversity in the ecosystem in terms of management philosophies, then you get a lot of progress because you compare and borrow certain attributes of, you know, what they do and, and vice versa. And we're one part of that. And by uh, contributing that, um, you know, to the blogosphere, uh, what we hope to do is spur on another generation of entrepreneurs to take it even further. And then, you know, we'll borrow some ideas back in. Next question. Hi, how's it going? Am I on? Yeah. Um, I came from a gaming industry background and watched how games... A little louder. Really, I came from a gaming industry background and watched how games really grew into the mobile space over the last few years and large publishers have begun um, really taking on that space now. How does mobile factor into uh, the growth of Netflix and this kind of video content in your mind? Uh, not a lot. Um, movies and TV shows are large screen centric. So most viewing will be on the large screen. Um, some viewing, um, not as much, will be on a laptop or iPad form factor. Uh, you know, high def, and then, you know, a lesser will be on uh, the mobile screen where it's sort of fill in and supplemental. So, you know, it's not zero, um, but for us, you know, the core is getting the internet to the television. Um, second is to the, the laptop form factors. Uh, third is to mobile. So, uh, you know, it's a five or ten percenter. Are you on the, have you made a deal with the iPad? Oh, we haven't. Is that because you're in the Microsoft board? No. <laughs> Okay, next question. <laughs> uh, right here. Hi, actually, I, uh, Sandeep Agarwal from Colin Stewart. Uh, I have two questions, actually, one for Reed and one for Michael. Uh, Reed, um, you know, the red box signed this 28, uh, 28 days uh, waiting window with uh, TWX uh, yesterday. You actually signed that last month. Uh, how do you evaluate a situation where, you know, you do something which is good for the EPS, but, you know, it means more waiting for the consumer? Um, and I guess I, I'll take the second question after Reed's answer. Um, if you look at the book industry, books come out first on hardcover, 20 to $30. After a few months, they come out on paperback at $10. Uh, and you know, people understand that, uh, you know, that's the way the book industry uh, maximizes profits. It's not a particularly profitable industry anyway, um, but, you know, there's a, a price tiering that goes on. Um, price tiering is natural in, in many markets. In a stadium, you don't do it by time, you do it by the quality of the seats. Some seats are $200, some are $20. Um, 
movies, there's a, a real artifact of US law called the first sale doctrine. Um, and it's utterly bizarre. So from a studio perspective, you would want to sell DVDs, have them just be for sale for some time period, like hardcover, and then to rent them in VOD and other, you know, uh, lower value, lower cost paperback, um, you know, at some interval later. That would be the right strategy. And you can do that in Europe. You can do that in much of the world. But in the U.S., oh, no, rental and s sales have to happen at the same time. So it, it's really punishing to studio profitability to do that. Um, and so what Warner Brothers is trying to generate is a very modest window, 28-day window, to separate uh, rental and sales. Uh, you know, in the long term, video stores are gone, and there's Redbox, you know, and, and NCR kiosks, and there's Netflix. Um, and so from a Warner Brothers perspective, if they get those two, um, then they create a window. And uh, what they want to do, you can think of it as delaying the rental window, or you can think of it as accelerating the sell-through window. Uh, and I think if everyone, if they just marketed it as, well, we're going to move sell-through up 30 days, which, by the way, has moved up, you know, 90 days over the last 10 years, uh, it would feel very positive. So, you know, they'll work on the marketing of pulling sell-through up. But I think everyone should realize it's just like hardcover and paperback. It's natural to have the high-value, more expensive format first, uh, which is buying a DVD and DVDs for sale, and then after some time period, have them be for rent. Do you fear the merger of NBC Universal and Comcast? Not particularly. Um, you know, there are aspects of it that could be troublesome for us, you know, but for the most part, um, you know, when Time Warner had Time Warner Cable, um, they were no easier or harder to deal with, you know, than now they don't have cable. So uh, cable and content, you know, the Universal is a big enough P&L and they've paid enough for it that you know, they pretty much have to maximize value on all of those assets. And you know, if we can pay a lot, um, then they'll take money from us, just like they'll take money from satellite, you know, because if they can pay a lot. Um, so n not fundamentally. Different cultures of management, however. Well, you know one both those terms probably better than I do. I don't, I don't know them one culturally. One was trained at Disney, believes in synergy, and Time Warner was the complete Opposite. Yeah, Synergy didn't work out too well for them on one of those big deals. On which company? On, on Time Warner AOL. So it would oh, make sense the that they're a little well, anti-Synergy right now. Well, the history of Steve Ross was buy all these companies and let them all operate completely independently. Yeah. And the history of Walt Disney was 180 degrees the opposite. So it's just they're different. And and uh, Brian Roberts and and uh, the Burke mentality is, is different than the Levin. It's just you'll find it somewhat different, I Let think. Let me ask you one question since I'll, uh, what was the best acquisition that Disney made in your, in your room? I was not a big acquisition person. I, uh, I'm too cheap. Uh, and I could never see paying for something out of ego to get it on the front page of the Wall Street Journal to be followed rather quickly on the obituary section. <laughs> so it just, it just felt to me that if you paid the prices for media companies and killed yourself in making it work, you would probably get it up to the level that it broke even. So other than the Capital Cities ABC deal, and I had worked at ABC for a decade, which was the, lo the most expensive acquisition at that time in history, other than that and the Family Channel and some little things, in my 21 years, we grew completely um, internally. I am, most acquisitions do not work. I forgot to ask you, I mean, a great acquisition would be Amazon buying you, but I didn't ask you about your views of acquisitions. But, but it, it's a very tough field, and you have to be really focused on that. I mean, do you agree with that? Have you, would you, have you made acquisitions so far? My uh, first company was very acquisitions oriented, and so I, I paid that pain and ended up on the obituary page. So, um, you. so uh, we have made no acquisitions and have no plans to. Next question, over here. So following up on comment, just like to hear, following up on the Amazon comment, just like to hear a little bit more about why you were confident, you know, Amazon wouldn't compete with you and, uh, you know, destroy you in your early days. 
Um, in the early days, we mailed DVDs and, and they mailed packages, and they focused on one-way delivery from relatively remote distribution centers because of the tax issues. And we focused on overnight delivery, and they focused on very few things coming back to them. Success for Amazon is nothing gets returned. Success for us is it all gets returned. We don't want people keeping it. Um, and so simple things like the notion of inventory turns. In their business, inventory turns means one thing. In our business, inventory turns means a completely different thing. Um, and you know that may sound trivial, but there's a hundred of those where a rental business is really different in the way you think and operate than a sales business. They were going to sell uh, everything, you know, they were going to try to be Walmart, right, for the online world, and they've been quite successful at it. Um, and Walmart's not good at renting. Blockbuster beat them uh, in the same way. Right. Excuse me. So it's just not a big enough focus area for them. They've got enormously talented people, but they put them on the next big sell-through market rather than on rental. So it's a niche strategy that rental was only an $8 billion market, all the video stores combined in the U.S., um, which is not that big a target when you're at the Amazon uh, growth ambitions and revenue size. You know, there'll be $100 billion in revenue you know, pretty soon probably. Next question right here. Jean-Baptiste Sue with the French News Agency. Uh, do you have any plans to extend uh, the Netflix service uh, to Western Europe, like France or Germany? Um, we've announced plans to expand uh, into one foreign country uh, later this year, uh, but we haven't uh, said anything more than that in terms of what country. Is there any more uh, Back in the back. Hey, Reed, Steve Herrick, IVP. Um, you saw that Gamefly uh, filed Ness One. I'm curious about your take on their business and why you've elected not to get into it to date. Um, uh, Gamefly uh, rents uh, game discs over the internet by mail. Um, so in that way, they're uh, somewhat similar. Um, and if we define ourselves as a disc shipping business, we're the best disc shipping business on the planet, then it makes perfect sense for us to ship other types of discs, not just movies, but also games, and maybe other than games, software, and you know, we're a disc shipper. Um, but we said, no, we're a movie business. You know, we're temporarily in the disc business, and then we're in streaming of the movies. And we're a movie brand, we're you know, focused on that. And so, although you know, we could be, it would be trivial to enter that market and trivial to compete in it, it didn't make sense under our brand because we're not trying to be that in the long term. And when streaming comes about on the gaming side, it's probably not going to be independent firms that lead that. It's much more likely to be Sony with their PSN, Xbox with their Xbox Live, uh, Nintendo with something like that. To have, they've all got their own um, stores. And so movies and games temporarily are both on optical disks that are compatible. But other than that, their industry structure is quite different. And once that breaks apart, the streaming won't be done, we don't think, in games by independent firms. So therefore, we said it's not good for us in the long term, so we shouldn't go after it in the short term because it becomes a distraction. We should be incrementally better and bigger on movies and TV shows. So that was our reasoning. We wish them well. We talk to them now and then. You know, they're great guys, um, and uh, I hope they're successful. Max, right here. Hi, Isabel Peanut. Um, how does, can you both discuss how the competitive environment changes for both Netflix as well as studios or content studios when Wi-Fi TV becomes more readily pervasive in the home? Well, Wi-Fi TV, um, or internet TV generally, um, creates a great new opportunity uh, for distribution um, to offer more and better services, better user interfaces, um, and creates more of a bidding war for content. What Contents wants is to have no one distribution channel be too much of the revenue, because then they get the power. And they want as many distributors as possible. So there's a whole new set of distributors, Hulu, Netflix, others, um, who are now in the business, uh, and that will bid up uh, content values. Um, so more distribution is uh, more distribution options are good for the consumer because they get more choices. It's good for uh, content because they have more people to sell to. Yeah, it's uh, 
you get a lot more content, you get a lot better content, and you get a lot worse content. Uh, when there were three networks, we probably would have been saved from reality TV. Um, but now with infinite number of distributors, there is an infinite variety of quality available. But for somebody who is making content, it depends which side of the street you're on. When I worked at ABC, it was great to be an oligarch. I mean, it was, you know, people actually said, you'll never work in this town again. I mean, I, can't, I sat there and I heard, some, I heard somebody say that. Now, you can't afford to say that because you are on, it, it is a much more competitive environment. I went from television with three networks to the movie business with eight companies and hundreds of other companies making independent films. And when there were three networks, if you didn't develop it yourself, I don't think I felt that way, but the industry felt that way, it was no good. So the odds of you taking something that was passed on by another company were very remote. When I went to a, a movie company, uh, we did Raiders of the Lost Ark, six movie companies had passed on that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It was, it was a no problem. It just meant how good it was. So this, this uh, increase in distribution channels, I mean, right now, I have a show called Glenn Martin DDS, which is a traveling dentist animated Simpsons-like family guy show, which nine companies passed on. And then I read in the New York Times about a distributor that was trying to change its philosophy, and I called them up, and the next thing I knew, I sold 20 episodes, and it's a big hit for them. So the world is a different world as far as the content people are concerned. Now, at the same time, you no longer have the ability to sell your movies the way you did 10 years ago when the uh, pay television services paid an insane amount of money for a movie, and a DVD would go out and 30, 40 million DVDs sold. And the problem, though, is it doesn't really matter because so many of the movie companies are so, oh, I got Twitter. So many of the movie companies are not run as well as some of the others <laughs> that what happened is when the DVD explosion came and all this extra money came flying in, they immediately gave it to the talent because temporary managers were not interested in making permanent decisions. They were interested in having the movie. So whatever the talent wants, the talent got. So all that incremental income basically went to the talent. Now that that money's not there, it's not there to go to the talent, so they're kind of back where they were, and it's more of a risk business. So it's a little bit like a, a pump, you know, a car, a carburetor, whatever it is. That's not right. Whatever those, what is that thing? Those you, you've got a, that's a great, um, leads to a great question, which is, uh, you've been involved, you refer to various compensation battles, you've thought a lot about long-term compensation as opposed to temporary managers. If you were on the board of Netflix, how would you structure my compensation? <laughs> Three ways. Uh, effective current management, how you're doing currently, and that would be what kind of leader you are, uh, is there a certain amount of philanthropic work, which I would include in it, uh, and vision. I would, I would try to compensate you on stock options for a, you know, I would have the stock options raised with inflation so they weren't automatic profitability. You actually had to do something. And then I would uh, compensate you um, unexpectedly for things that you may do that kept you flexible and nimble, that were, were uh, effective. And I would give you zero in bad years. That is the key. The key to compensation is that, and no company does this. We did it, I think, but most companies don't do it. They give on the upside, they give on the downside. If you actually don't give on the downside, the upside is so much more appreciated <laughs> and so much more not taken for granted. 
and, and I think that's part of the banking problem is that they were just giving upside, up, you know, whatever. And, uh, and, 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 and one of the problems with having boards that are in people's pockets, if they're not responsible, is the board is not capable of saying to the management, you guys did a really bad job, so we're not going to compensate you. Next question. Over here. Uh, hi, Reid. Uh, Jim from Fly, uh, 3D Social Experience Dashboard. Uh, going back to a technology perspective, over the next 12 months on the streaming side uh, of your business, what are the big pain points of user experience that you're looking to improve within that nimble time frame? I would say over the next couple of years, because we won't get it fixed in 12 months, um, the main thing is to create an incredible experience on the television screen for choosing entertainment. Um, we've had uh, 10 years of experience improving our website to make it better and better for choosing entertainment. Um, and on the TV, uh, you've got a different field of view because you sit farther back. Uh, you've got a different input device than a keyboard and a mouse. Um, and so there's a different set of trade-offs that are appropriate to help people, to make it easy to choose the content right on the TV. So we've got, um, you know, uh, probably five or ten years of work on making that better and better and better. If you think of um, Google search and you say, you know, ten years ago they were wildly better than Alta Vista, and, you know, and if you used them back then you were like, this is amazing. And yet, you think how far they've come in 10 years. I mean, the autocomplete, the amazing stuff, uh, uh, everything that's going on and that, it's quite really quite impressive. So think of that as that's what's going to happen in TV content merchandising. The internet brings an incredible wave of innovation. And just as you see uh, Google and Bing going back and forth, and you know, now Bing's doing this incredible stuff on video search and you know, trying to find differentiation, and Google will retaliate. And when they go back and forth, all of us win. Um, the same thing's going to happen on the internet. You know, By the way, if you do that, that would be a big bonus. That would be worth a big bonus. That would be worth a big bonus. I, direct TV, how do you find where anything is? Yeah. <laughs> you, it is you, so aggravating. And if you have a wife, it's even worse. It's the, it's the, it's the TV by a monopoly. So, you know, it, it, it's you know, just. When you look at the rate of innovation of the internet, you know, we'll compete, you know, with Hulu and YouTube, you know, we'll cross fertilize, you know, we'll learn from each other. And, you know, every month we're going to have new ideas um, to constantly improve it on the algorithm side, on the user interface side. It's going to be an unbelievably exciting time in the next 10 years as internet television, you know, radically transforms the user interface. And people will say, well, you know, what's your vision for what it's going to be? You know, honest to God, we don't know. Um, the great thing about learning, if you ask the Google guys what's search going to be in 10 years, all they could tell you is it's going to be a lot better. You know, for a long time they didn't understand the role of autocomplete and how powerful that was, or all the various real time, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, you know, search is going to get better, and TV user interface is going to get incredibly better as it becomes basically a web browser. And then you've got open innovation from a wide range of firms. Um, and so that'll be one of the biggest changes that we see over the next 10 years. Okay, we have a couple more questions right here. Uh, Jack Jackson with Bull Iguana Software. So talking about innovation, my question was, have you thought about having Netflix do original content uh, like a YouTube but structured series? A Sopranos made by small studios, small independent firms, things like that. I planted that question. <laughs> I, I, I think it'd be a great idea if you're using it. about six involved. shows we'd like to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Let's get them. Let's get them. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll license all kinds of content. Um, so, uh, you know, whether it's by small independent producers, whether it's by uh, people like Michael of Great Track Records, um, you know, uh, we just want to get more content, you know, in front of our users. Don't you think if you, let's say you did 20 shows, let's say you did 100 shows, 60 of them were fine, 20 of them were horrible. 18 of them were good, and two were cultural phenomena. And all you need is one, if you had one cultural phenomenon, one Cosby show, one Sopranos, one Saturday Night Fever, whatever it is, wouldn't that define you and separate you from the pack? Didn't the Sopranos push HBO to a new level? <laughs> so the answer is yes. <laughs> All right. I, I would say, uh, 
you asked, would it? I would say, yeah. Uh, but I would say, if you were a shareholder at Netflix and Netflix was going to try to capture the cultural zeitgeist and to pull off 100 episodes or 100 shows, you should short our stock because- Not at all. Well, okay, Not at all. I would, uh, I would buy your stock depending on who you did it with. If you did it with some lunatic Hollywood executive who, who was doing it on a broadcast or even cable financial uh, model, then you would not get that bonus. But if you did it on a model, economic model, a union model, a new talent model, not going for the existing overpriced talent, but going for the young new talent, you would change the uh, feel and look of Netflix, in my opinion. The problem is people coming into Hollywood, you take Marvin Davis. Marvin Davis came in, he bought, he bought, he bought 20th Century Fox. He came from the oil business. He was in Palm Springs at his country club. He was sitting next to Lucille Ball. She was 140. <laughs> he made a deal with her. He thought she would bring in, so you have to find that, that and it's hard because we're all con men in Hollywood, so as you know. We, we all know our limits, or you know, maybe one of the, the graces of getting older is knowing your limits. And I'm confident I'd be closer to Marvin Davis than... than I doubt it. You know, Because uh, the technology companies are not oil companies. Technology companies deal with innovation all the time. And Hollywood is about innovation. It's just a story innovation. It's not, you know, chip innovation. All right, last question. Uh, I have a question to read. And uh, I personally think that the business model idea of Netflix is pretty brilliant because it, you came up with it from the idea, observation that it's pretty cheap to ship around the DVDs. And what I'm curious about actually is, how did you actually come up with the finalized design of the business model? Did, you, did it take some like trial and error or did you get it right from the beginning? Finalized design of the business model? Yeah. Was that your question? Uh, we haven't yet. <laughs> uh, you know, it's an, I mean, it's evolved every year. You know, we, uh, first we started with pay-per-view, pay-per uh, movie shipment, and then we went to unlimited cap, or it was uh, subscription but capped, and then it was unlimited for 20 bucks, and then it was all different price points, and then it's with streaming, and you know, you continue to adapt. Uh, you know, we're optimized for innovation, evolution, um, finding opportunities, the growth of the internet, and so we're very adaptive. That's what our, you know, premise is, uh, is that uh, in the technology space, when the underlying foundations are driven by Moore's Law and its equivalents in networking, that those firms that are organized for innovation uh, will prosper. And so that's why every, we make a, a number of sacrifices on what we do to be organized for innovation, and that's our prime focus. My take on the company is that you're way closer to content than you're admitting. You have a... No, they have a, uh, most technology companies do not have the number of executives and the quality of executives that you have in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And you would not be as successful if you did not have the, right now it's a licensing business, it's a being in, at Warner Brothers Studios and at Paramount and at Disney and around town. You are totally in the environment of content. and. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure talking to you and hearing about it, as always, and uh, we both thank you all very much. Thank you. Oh, well, um, that was fun. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Reed. Um, in Churchill Club tradition, we're going to now present you with the timeless um, and, and uh, illustrious Churchill Club t-shirt. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to do two things before closing. Uh, first is to again thank Fenwick and West for sponsoring the program tonight, but also on behalf of Netflix to um, ask Ashu Gol, if he's still here, to go out to the um, front desk uh, on the way out because you've been selected to receive a 
Netflix subscription for one year at no charge to you. So thank you all for coming tonight, and we'll see you at the next program. Good night. <laughs>